All right, welcome to another episode of the Back to Square Quant podcast. Today, we have a very uh, special guest all the way from uh, the other side of the world, uh, still stuck in the past, all right? Uh, here, it's already uh, the 17th of uh, March, right? Whenever our listeners are hearing this, but uh, Jane here, she's she's from Ireland. Uh, so it's, yeah, a little bit later on a Wednesday night. So thank you very much, Jane, for uh, coming on to this podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so a little bit of a background, right? I mean, correct me if uh, I missed out anything or if I'm wrong, that uh, you are a power lifter and you this you just competed in nationals and this is your first year in the Open. Yes, yeah. Okay. I just had Open Nationals last weekend. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. How did you go? How did I go? Um, I came seventh out of nine, which, nine, which was good because I was nominated second last coming into it. So I moved up a ranking. So. Nice. <laughs> yeah, for, oh. for the, for, yeah, for, for those that don't know, I think, uh, uh, I, I think Ireland and uh, New, like New Zealand, we're quite uh, similar, you know, like we are, we're quite small, right? In the sense, but powerlifting yeah. actually is quite, people take it quite seriously. Uh, and yeah. I, I have, uh, I have like a couple of friends in Ireland, and uh, your your meets are quite uh epic, right? Especially I uh, the, the the apps invitational. I think that that has always yeah. been a really really like big uh big meet with uh, a lot of theatricals, and I think that this year's nationals was an apps, right? So uh, yeah. I'm pretty sure. I mean, by the look of it, it looked really like uh, uh epic as well. So it must be a must be a good experience uh that you had. Yeah, it's, I have to say for like such a small country, I think we really kind of have put on a mark in the comps that we run. Um, I know that Irish Nationals was the very first competition I went to, for, to watch in 2020. And it was, you know, the lights and the smoke machines and everything like that. And um, our coach Jay at Abs just really took it up a level this year for um, Nationals. It just makes it it makes it easy to watch and enjoyable to watch for everyone. And it really kind of makes it into like a spectacle. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. So yeah, besides being uh, a power lifter, uh, Jane is also a uh, dietitian, registered dietitian. So she does like nutrition, uh, I, I assume for, uh, for like general clients, but also for power lifters. Uh, currently uh, she's doing like her IOPN, uh, uh, PG dip right postgraduate diploma. Uh, yeah. yeah. Full disclosure. Uh, I I'm 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 like your alumni because I I, I did it like ages ago, <laughs> right? When oh. <laughs> yeah. So we, we actually have more 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 things in common. Uh, I saw I saw your your. I saw you answering uh one of your questions on Instagram and you were like oh uh I'm currently doing the IOPN uh diploma. I, I when I did it it was still called like. The ISSN the post- performance. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So- oh, so that's what it has changed to. Because I, yeah. I always knew it as ISSN as well. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. uh, so yeah, the guru performance uh, postgraduate diploma. Uh, so I think you change it because like you get quite a bad like uh rep calling yourself a guru, right? In the in the online yeah. fitness. On, in the online oh, who's not a who, yeah. but who's not a guru these days though? Yeah. If, if you're a, Especially- if if you're a fitness uh, person online. Yeah. So yeah, full, uh, I'm I'm kind of like part of part of like one of the first few cohorts. Uh, so yeah, we have more more things in common. Uh, shout out to Lawan that Banok. I probably mispronounced yeah. his first name, but I, the English <laughs> people call him Laron. So, but it's like yeah, but it's like yeah. So, uh, maybe you can fill up what uh I have missed out, right? So let us know exactly a little bit more in detail what you do. Uh in the day-to-day life when it comes to uh, your, your job uh, coaching nutri- uh, people when it comes to nutrition? Yeah, so I um, studied human nutrition and dietetics in um, Trinity College Dublin and Dublin Institute of Technology. Um, I finished that in 2020. Um, and since then, I've pretty much been working as a clinical uh, dietitian uh, full-time. So I started working um, originally in a field hospital that was set up um, because of the COVID pandemic. Um, So that was really interesting. It was actually a hospital that was in the middle of a basketball court in in a university. 
in Limerick um, and since then I've gone on to work in different areas. I've worked in renal medicine, I've worked in cardiology and heart transplants and I currently work um, as a community dietitian in mental health and um, so really dealing with a lot of eating disorders um, and weight gain related to antipsychotic medication. Um, so that's really my like day to day job. Um, and then I also do uh, nutrition coaching for powerlifting. I have a few um, Olympic weightlifters as well. Um, I have one cross fitter. He's kind of new to me. So we're, we're still kind of figuring that one out. Um, but the bread and butter of what I do is, um, you know, weight cutting for competition. I had uh, three people at nationals at the weekend. Um, I've had a few uh, members of the Irish team um, last year competing at Worlds and European, um, cutting in for that. Um, so I coach under Abs Powerlifting, which is my powerlifting club. Yeah, awesome. I think it's it's always good to hear that people who study nutrition and I guess this is kind of like my personal like gripe uh, nutrition and being a dietitian actually giving back um, not just through the general population but everyone else because I think powerlifting gets specifically for powerlifting there's there's always a really I wouldn't say like a bad rep but there's always this association where powerlifters mm-hmm. is, uh, eat donuts drink your yeah. drink your monster or red bull and uh and lift and I think being in that space of like you know what like yes there is obviously macros but you know for for Jane as you probably would tell your clients is there's more to it than just macros (laughs) and I think being a dietitian and I think being a dietitian working in you know the fields that you would that you do as like as a Mm day-to-day um how 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 I guess for our listeners out there who those so for those who are potentially a little bit confused uh, what is at least in Ireland? Because I think this is very different to the US. I think even in New Zealand, it, it is a bit blurred. What are some of the mm-hmm. main differences between being an, an RD like yourself, um, a, yeah. a, a someone who's just like a like a nutrition a nutritionist? And I think we also have. I don't know if this is the same in Ireland as well as a nutrition coach. Yeah. So I suppose um, I would call what I do with um my powerlifting clients nutrition coaching um because really what a dietitian is and what dietetics is um it's the clinical application of nutrition science so someone who calls themselves a nutritionist is someone who has usually studied the field of nutrition um versus dietetics is usually the clinical application of that nutrition in the context of an illness um or a medical setting um, the difference also in Ireland is that dietitian is a protected term um, versus nutritionist isn't. So that means that anybody can call themselves um, a nutritionist, but you have to be registered um, with our, our board. It's called CORU. Um, they also, it's the board that physiotherapists, occupational therapists, optometrists, we all register under the same board. Um, you have to be registered with them to call yourself a dietitian. Um, and what that means is you've completed a degree that has um, at least 1,000 hours uh, clinical placements in it. So over the course of my degree, I would have done 1,000 hours uh, clinical placements um, in hospital settings, in community settings, in clinics. Um, and I really think the difference, the main difference is that that piece that I said that not just anybody can call themselves a dietitian. You have to have done your credentials um and your placement with people face to face and that was probably where I learned the most in college compared to my all the lectures I did and all the biochemistry I did was face to face uh working with people and you know that's where the real problems come up that can't be can't be solved easily um so I think that's really what does set set us apart yeah yeah I think at the end of the day, I mean, if you look at uh, nutrition as a field, it's it's quite funny because uh, my my stereotype when it comes for comes to powerlifting, uh, powerlifters, I said that every powerlifter was once uh, aspiring bodybuilder until they realized they don't like to control their food, you know. So that's why they became yeah. <laughs> uh, powerlifter. So that's Pretty like my, my my stereotype, you know. And the the thing is, I don't know about you, but what I've noticed in the recent years as well is that the attention towards uh, nutrition 
uh, for powerlifting is definitely growing. You know, I've have had, mm-hmm. I've had, I've had a lot of uh, inquiries uh, on like nutrition coaching, and honestly, I'm quite surprised because for someone uh, who has done like formal uh, studies in like um, my background is uh, sports and exercise nutrition, right? So I learned mm-hmm. nutrition specifically for like uh, exercise performance. Uh, powerlifting is actually a very uh, straightforward sport, right? The energy systems, uh, the the pathways involved in powerlifting is actually very, very straightforward. I mean, you're doing like most of the time in competition, you're doing like, oh, cool. You're doing like nine reps, you know? Uh, yeah. Like how complex can that be? But then I don't even you... think you get up to 50 reps, including warm-ups for the whole day. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. And, it, and if you miss your reps, uh, which people of, sometimes do, you don't even complete nine, nine total reps. So, you know, at the end of the day, how... Uh, when I think of, you think of it from the perspective, like how you compare that to uh, endurance uh, athlete, right? I did my master's research yeah. uh, in uh, uh, cup, in carbohydrates for endurance athlete, which is quite ironic because uh, I definitely do not uh, look like I run. Neither do I uh, enjoy running at all. Uh, so it's actually very uh, it's it's vastly different. You know the pathways, the the nutrient timing, and all of that matters even more. Yeah. But, when you even to- the carrying the like having the supply for food i mean you take an endurance runner you have to take into account how are they going to carry their carbs how are they going to get so, yeah, yeah. again that's something that's very easy <laughs> yeah the, the carbohydrate recommendation for uh endurance athletes they it's absolutely ridiculous like you know i don't think you can eat uh that yeah. kind of like food from get that eat carbohydrates you know in that amount you have probably have to drink a, a, a huge chunk of them and so when you, you you look at it from the perspective and then when you start speaking to people uh you realize that you know not everybody actually are hitting kind of like a baseline you know let's just say 1.6 grams of protein which is not that high right for most people who are not in a severe deficit 1.6 grams of protein per kilo body weight some like powerlifters they even like fall short of that right but i think yeah. being in the in the the feel of actually like working or like learning about it, you'd be like, oh yeah, this is easy. And especially if you do it yourself and you think that hitting this amount of protein is easy because you do it every single day. But when you speak to people, it's actually not as easy as you think for some people. And every Mm -hmm. individual would present their own challenges. And until you speak to them, uh, you don't realize what those challenges are. So most of the time, at least for me, uh, I don't know how different it is for you, uh, when you did your practice, maybe you can share uh, a little bit insight in, into that. But for me, I always try to understand what are certain barriers that are preventing someone mm-hmm. from actually hitting those numbers, right? Those numbers are just something to, to kind of like strive towards. And uh, sometimes the range is bigger, right? And obviously when it comes to competition time, you have to, the, the margin of error is much smaller, right? So the question yeah. is, what are the barriers, right? That are actually preventing someone from, let's just say, hitting the adequate protein. And most of the time it's like, it's, behavioral right you you work in like uh yeah. like you said you work in like the clinical psych psychology side of like eating as well so you would know that eating affects people's behavior a lot or and vice versa the behavior affects someone's mm-hmm. eating patterns and i think at the end of the day uh you you did mention speaking to people that would really give you like the most uh valuable experience when it comes to coaching because personally i think that when it, when it is, uh, let's just say, as long as the guidelines, right, uh, for like, okay, cool, this is a specific macronutrient range that you you hit, right? Mm. Uh, as long as you fall within that range, uh, most you, you actually don't even have to remember whatever, like, you don't have to remember the crap cycle, you know, whatever uh, biochemistry <laughs> pathway, you know, all of that is like almost useless when it comes to coaching people. Uh, what you really need to know is that, all I have to remember is that, cool, these are like recommended ranges, until the science uh, change, uh, I, which I don't think it will soon, uh, getting people to reach there is something that's a little bit more important. It's more important. And more often than not, you probably would not be able to learn it until you start speaking to people. Yeah. And I think like starting out nutrition coaching, you know, it is very easy to give people numbers on a page, but are you going to actually be able to help them to reach those numbers? That's what they, that's what they want because they, I mean, they can use calculators. There's self-made apps now to tell people targets for, uh, you know, their calories or their protein, but there's obviously some reason why they're not reaching those goals. And 
I think what kind of sets my own practice apart and I'm very lucky as well that I work with another dietitian in abs powerlifting um is that you know in college I would never have given people numbers you know or in my own practice you uh, if I meet a person who needs diabetes education you know it, it's very practical advice that you give you give people and you try to break it down to some level that they can understand and I think that that's what I really try to do is when I give advice you know if I'm saying a certain protein target and a person is 20 grams under that you know how, how can they reach that and what you mentioned there about barriers that's something that I really try to break through with people um you know you probably see it yourself as coaches that people will be like oh I didn't have a good week so I didn't check in and I didn't fill in like anything and it's like those are actually the weeks that I need you to tell me more you know so I always say to people like if you didn't track at all today like please just fill in the comment section and tell me why you know what was the thing that stopped you from being able to do that because we need to learn that barrier so that we can we can work around it um and I would again kind of going with my dietetic background I would very much so focus on people's diet quality as well um and I suppose I'm very cautious of people's relationship with food now working in like the psychology side of things so I really do try to take um a more holistic approach to people's nutrition um and I do think you're right that the demand for nutrition coaching is rapidly expanding in powerlifting and I think it's good because I feel like before it was very much so people got in touch with someone like a couple of weeks out from a comp and they wanted to cut weight and that was it and like a lot of people have speak, speak in the past of like weight cutting experiences for comp that led them to have really poor relationships with food and poor relationships with you know making weight and their diet so I think that nearly near year round work with someone you know in your off season and when you're looking at your comp season is is really important I think people are starting to understand that a bit more yeah I think uh, like I think you definitely uh made a really good point there Jane Uh, you know in the past people would just come to a coach for like hey I need to make weight I'm five kilos over I'm four weeks out and you're kind of like well uh (laughs) But then yeah. <laughs> I think, yeah, but I think, I think um, what Kedrick also mentioned is quite, uh, was quite good that I think a lot of the powerlifters, specifically for powerlifters these days, are starting to value uh, nutrition more. And this is just completely observational, but I think it's also uh, heightened. I, I think the demand for nutrition coaching or nutritional help in general is actually heightened quite a lot, particularly with the pandemic. Because I think in, mm-hmm. in the past, like powerlifters, like, oh, you know, I've, I've trained four times a week, you know, like my, my, energy, my energy expenditure is up, you know, like I, yeah. I, I can eat, you know, and I know it's not great, but my health and my weight isn't necessarily affected too much. And I'm always within that one to two kilo, maybe two and a half a bigger, bigger people to weight cut into their category. But I think what you know, and I don't want this to be a COVID thing, but I think as the pandemic did hit, I think a lot of these powerlifters who have trained in gyms and, you know, and all of us have experienced that, I'm sure, um, who didn't have the luxury to train at home um, for X mm. period of time, they start to realize like, oh shit, like actually um, I'm putting on a lot of weight and I don't actually feel really good. And I think they then result back to saying, oh, I just need to go back and powerlift. But then the reality is that when they actually go back into power, they're like, why is my weight not coming off? Like the use, yeah. I, you know, like when I was training, I was always two kilos, have two kilos above my, my, my weight class. You know, why am I 10 kilos above my weight class? I'm not doing anything different. I think that probably is one of the big reasons as to, well, at least observationally, I think why, especially in the last couple of years, despite, you know, the pandemic, obviously now we're over it, kind of, kind of. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that sparked a lot of like nutritional help from powerlifters because then they start to realize like, Hey, I think um, I I would love to stay in a sport. I could do more in that weight class, but I think it's not just about training to get my weight down. There's definitely more to it. Um, Which brings me to an interesting question because you mentioned currently, currently you are also working in a sort of like in a psychology mental health setting for the dietitian portion, obviously coaching nutrition on the side. 
Um, and mm-hmm. I always have this very interesting conversation with, well, powerlifters in general is that, and I want to get your thoughts on this as, as an RD, is that weight class sports, especially for uh, people who are new to the, to the sport, tends to have a very, tends to potentially steer someone into potentially developing eating disorders because they're like, I need to stay in this weight class. And the, you know, they, they, they tell their nutritionists or dietitians like, look, like these are the macros. They're not working. Like we need to push it down and you do all the other things. Um, yeah. Maybe just, I guess there's not necessarily a question, but what are your thoughts on yeah. that? Because I'm sure you, you see that in your clinical practice with the actual mental yeah. health. Um, but and I'm also sure you start to see that as well with powerlifters who you coach you're like hey actually you know like the way that we're approaching this you know I'm, I'm kind of a bit worried that you know I don't want to stay down that path yeah of course and I totally would agree with you there and um me and my boyfriend were only having this conversation last weekend because obviously you no know, nationals and everyone was cutting weight and we were just kind of like the things that people do to like make weight it's not no it's not normal mm. eating you know it, it wouldn't be considered orderly eating you know um, and there's actually um, a friend of mine via Instagram, Louisa Vargas. I'm not sure if either of you follow her, but she actually did her uh, research projects on um, like disordered eating habits um, in powerlifters who cut weight and whether wow. they felt like that affected or contributed to it. Um, I believe it's been published, um, but it, it's a very interesting read and I found it very interesting um and it kind of highlighted the need for people to have some level of I suppose psychological support if they feel like weight cutting is affecting them and anecdotally I've spoke to people who are like oh yeah when I was cutting to like this weight class like I would like not eat for a week and then the week after comp like I'd eat everything inside and I'd gain a load of weight and really developing these like not healthy cycles and I have had a few people that I've, I've spoke to them about that um it was kind of a situation that we were coming we were coming into a comp and like they weren't really sure whether they were going to do the comp and then they were like oh no I'm just going to wait for this one so um like we'll just kind of like stop the diet and I was like well really what we want to focus on here is sustain if you want to stay in this weight class we want to focus on like sustainably keeping you near this weight class and a big thing for that person was breaking them out of that cycle that I just said there like cut 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 for comp comps over food freedom gain weight and then end up back in the same situation having to cut 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 back into comp um because I don't really think that's the healthiest for anyone in terms of their their mental health um so yeah I certainly agree with you that it can push people in that direction but I do believe weight class selection and appropriate weight class selection plays a massive part um in that I even though I like part of my job is helping people to cut weight I am a massive like person for saying you should not be cutting weight and you know when it's not appropriate because um again this is a conversation I was having with the other dietitian that I work with recently that we kind of feel like weight class weight cutting has nearly kind of become like this rite of power, passage in powerlifting and people feel like to be on some level of eliteness that they should be cutting weight um when really that's not what it's intended for at all um so yeah even though I help people cut weight I am very much so ready to tell people <laughs> when they should not be cutting weight or when it's just too much. Yeah, hundred percent. I think um, the big thing as well, you kind of have to, uns- uh, we, we, we kind of have to understand is that uh, powerlifting and as a weight class sport is relatively new. And a lot of mm. the practices from powerlifting, they stem from combat sport athletes. Right. And yeah, you, I mean, if you watch any form of MMA or UFC or whatever, uh, you would say that those athletes are built differently, right? Whether it's physically yeah. or in their head, right? Uh, so I've read papers where they uh, evaluated uh, the experience of combat athletes cutting and what you say is right. Uh, it, it seems like it is a rite of passage. The person 
because what they also do is that they, when it comes to boxing or fighting, there's this huge intimidation factor when it comes to your opponent because you want to punch the guy, you want to knock him out, you want to submit him, you want to tap him out, right? And mm. th- that, there is that huge intimidation factor that if you can impose on your opponent, it would be to your advantage. And one of the papers I've read, they said that making weight and cutting hard and making it makes it seem like I'm more intimidating, you know? Yeah. And even in combat sport athletes, uh, they said that they overestimated uh, how well they could recover after they actually uh, cut weight. So I think all of that is like mm-hmm. very, very important to keep in mind because while the practices can be slightly different, obviously due to different weight and times, people often have that, that same mindset, I need to cut weight because if I cut weight, I'm badass, you know, like when it comes to powerlifting, yeah. I need mm-hmm. to do this. I will brag about the crazy weight cut that I, I did, yeah. you know, and then yep. uh, even if I don't lift well, I w- people will be like, oh, wow, you cut so much weight, you know, next time uh, you, you probably can lift X amount of weight more if you didn't have to do all this. But the fact is that we can't really evaluate that counterfactual because we don't really know, you know, and the fact exactly. is that yeah. you yeah. really need to cut that amount of weight. I think those are very like important uh, questions to ask. And I, I know the study, right? So uh, I, I, I know Louisa. Uh, I mean, we, we, we met in Sweden and we, I, I, I was doing my research there uh, uh, while, while I was in Sweden. And then I, I spoke to her and then she told me she was like doing something as well. And then like we, we became friends. Uh, we, we exchange ideas, right? So her, her paper is called like Weight on the Bar versus Weight on the Scale, a Qualitative Exploration yeah. of Disordered Eating in Competitive Female Powerlifters. So it's really, a, yeah, it's a really interesting study. Uh, she did it in female powerlifters and based on the combat sport literature, we look at female powerlifters also have higher tendency of actually developing uh, eat, eating disorders compared to male, uh, male, mm-hmm. male athletes, right, in general. And I also think that female powerlifters often have some form of, uh, they do prioritize a certain look more, which might predispose yeah. them to want to cut more as well, right? Uh, because when I speak to female uh, athletes, they will be like, oh yeah, you know, uh, I'm okay. Uh, I'm not really, I don't really need to cut as much, but I would like to cut a little bit more so I can look a little bit better. You know, we, I often get that quite a bit. And mm-hmm. prior to the IPF establishing the uh, 69 kilo weight class, most of the female lifters would rather like chop off their head, chop off their legs, then move from 63 all the way to 72. To 72. You know? yeah. So, yeah, it was such a big jump. I was really glad that they they brought that in um, I think it changed things for a, a lot of people because even like if you take it as a female I mean I was considering myself in 2020 uh, competing as a 72 coming into 2021 it was just going to depend on I wanted to make the junior uh, world yeah. team so I was just going to see who was in each weight class and I wasn't planning to be a full 72 but even the idea of like going from 63 kilos to a 70 it's a 10 kilo, kilo jump like, pretty much it's a 10 kilo jump so i feel like them changing around those weight classes have facilitated that a lot better for people even like people like you know jessica uh, bittner not having to cut to like 72 she's only cutting to 76 now and um, so i was really glad when they brought in those new female weight classes <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's that's really. Uh, I think it's I think it's important to, to have conversations about that because at the end of the day, um, our our role is like when it, when we do nutrition coaching, we often play second fiddle mm-hmm. to the actual powerlifting coaching, you know. And yeah. like I always tell people, like you know, nutrition is, uh, like Robin to Batman, right? Uh, yeah. So nutrition is like the assistance towards uh Batman, which is like the training, you know. Uh. And at the end of the day, uh, we always play second fiddle. And if you work with someone and you don't coach the person's training, you'll be like, yeah, I'm, this person has uh, been uh, doing really well. But when the person cuts and the performance is impacted, who is to blame, right? I'm like, usually yeah. the, like the nutritionist would be the, the person uh, that, 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 that gets the blame. But the thing is that, you know, there is like no way to kind of like avoid it. I read, I read a paper uh, done by uh, the like researchers in uh from uh, Liverpool John Laws where uh, they yeah. actually uh, it's a case study on a boxer where they had a lot of weight to make for this boxer and they had to cut his protein intake down because they knew he couldn't make weight without losing uh if he didn't 
uh, lose muscle mass. So they made him intentionally lose muscle mass because the timeline was right. too short. But because it's a sport, right, where it's a boxing, yeah. boxing is a sport where it's uh, mostly, it's, it's more technical rather than like uh, wrestling or jujitsu mm-hmm. where muscle mass actually like plays a larger role. Uh, so the, the boxer could get away with it. But when it comes to powerlifting, uh, losing muscle mass would potentially uh, reduce uh, the ability to produce force. So we definitely can't mm-hmm. exploit that, you know, but there, there are things where people have to understand, you know, if you're, if you're going to cut like uh, four or five percent, you know, you can still go by. Some people might not even be able to take that cut, especially if they are really new to a uh, weight cutting. Uh, and, but some people I've, I, in my survey, I, I've seen people cut like a totality of almost like 10%. And I'm like, mm-hmm. dude, like, this is like pretty crazy, you know? Uh, not, not to mention if someone is new to cutting, uh, I remember this story. Uh, I, so I, I remember, for example, uh, in Calgary in 2018 Worlds, right? Like Isabella uh, von Eisenberg, she didn't make uh, weight. Yes. Yeah. So she yeah. was like, she was like right to the last minute, she didn't make weight. And I don't want to psychologize and pick, uh, pick her thoughts out, but because if she, that was the year that uh, Kimberly Walford didn't compete. And if she would yeah. just stay in the 72 class, right? she would probably be the champion, you know, and, but then mm. yeah, she didn't get to compete at all. Uh, so even experienced lifters like her uh, w- would still have an issue, to, uh, would still have issues making weight. So what more uh, someone that has no experience whatsoever doing this for the first time? Yeah. And I mean, let's face it, all right. Uh, whether it comes, whatever method you use when it comes to, uh, and if you've never cut weight before, it's going to be tough. There, there are a list of like methods we can use. We can talk about that uh, right after. Yeah. Uh, but because the methods you use are, are something that you don't use frequently, right? It's going to be different. And because it's different, it's going to post its own challenges, whether it's low gut volume. I mean, a low gut volume diet, right? It's, it's not nice to eat, you know? Like I, it's absolutely horrible and your food choices are so limited and, especially yeah. on the last couple of days where you have to like reduce your sodium intake. The only reason why fat like tastes good when it comes to like fried chicken is because they oh. have salt, right? And fat combined. If you just have fat by itself, man, not mm. nice at all. MCT oil. Yeah. yeah. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> water loading, uh, water cutting. I mean, uh, like if people, imagine if you, are, you work in like, uh, like say clinical setting and you actually have to deal with patients most of the time, you can't be going to the toilet. You know, I had a lifter who's a pilot, right? Uh, and yeah. You, yeah, I mean, yeah. he said like, you know, we, I, I said like, yeah, you know, we just have to diet you down because uh, you're, you are still working uh, the, the, meet, the, the week prior to your comm. We are not going to have you flying the plane and going to the toilet all the time, you know, uh, things like that. <laughs> and then obviously the, the worst would be, I mean, not, not the worst, but uh, and the worst, I, I quantify worst by the most painful in the shortest amount of time would be uh, trying to lose weight to uh, dehydration via heat, right? Like that yeah. itself, if you're not someone that's not, that doesn't tolerate heat well, that's going to be really, really uh, uh, hard to do, you know? So they all pose their, their different challenges. So knowing what to use is also very important. So my, my, my question yeah. to you is that, uh, let's just say, um, do you have a hierarchy of what you would usually use first, right? Yeah. So usually we pick the low hanging fruit, right? Let's just say if, this person is like 1% above uh, body weight, what would you do? If this person is like 2%, what would you do? 3%, what would you do? 4%, what, what would you do? And I think to start that off, maybe you can share what would be your cutoff point where you said, no, you just have to compete in the higher weight class, right? How many percent yeah. above their, their, their weight class would you recommend that they cut? Uh, you can probably also separate that into two categories. What is something that you're comfortable with? Like, you know, this person will would make weight very unlikely the performance will be impacted and what's the maximum weight you will allow somebody to cut down so uh, you can start with this too and then you can share on your hierarchy on how uh, yeah. which methods you will use first yeah so I think I definitely use a hierarchy uh, method because we all those methods that you described there I mean moving up from like the fiber up to like the water load and the dehydration methods there's like increasing levels of fatigue and like effect that they have. So if we only have to drop a little bit of weight, there's no need for you to be sitting in the sauna for 
for two hours. And this is something I often have to explain to people who it's their first wake up because they have this perception that like that it's all of it. It's it's everything. Um, I would usually, you know, I would say my lowest uh, hanging fruit would be low fiber and low food volume. Um, I think people can have great results from that, especially if they've been dieting. They've probably been having somewhat of a high fiber diet, um, you know, for food volume and things like that. So they usually respond quite well to that. Um, I would always try to kind of lower salt uh, kind of the two days before competition, just so nobody has any random weight spikes or hang, hang, hangs on to any extra water. Um, then my next step would be a water load. And for actually a lot of my clients recently, I've only done a water load and they haven't needed to water cut. I've just brought them back to their normal level of water intake. Um, because uh, for a lot of them, I've noticed once they've started to water load, their weight starts to, to drop. Um, and doing the cut part, you know, really reducing their water intake hasn't actually dropped their weight uh, much further. So I would do the water load and then I drop their water intake back to their normal amount. If someone has a bit more weight to lose, we would do a water cut. Um, and then specifically really looking at cutting the water off a certain amount of time before the person weighs in. Um, I'm not really a fan of doing um, sweating uh, via dehydration and heat methods for two hour weigh-ins. Um, I do have some lifters who compete in the ab series and that would be a 24 hour weigh-in. So I would give more leeway to those lifters to have more weight to lose, but I am quite strict when it comes to a two hour weigh-in. I don't like to be doing uh, more than 5% uh, from an acute weight cutting strategy. I mean, that's what all the, the literature really points us to is that going above 5% is going to have um, effects on performance. So I will have a discussion with a lifter. Um, you know, if they have more weight to lose, obviously we'll try to use the, you know, the long-term diet alongside the acute diet. Um, but I'll usually try and set a date where we need to be to make the lower weight class. Um, and if we're not looking like we're going to be there at that date, I will suggest uh, going up to the higher weight class. Um, just from the point of view of, I, you know, as you say, they have a coach and they have a nutrition coach, but a lot of the time if a meet doesn't go well because of a weight cut, it does fall back on you. And from like a safety perspective, I'm not comfortable putting people through really, really harsh, intensive cuts because I just don't stand by it. I mean, maybe if you are Isabella von Weissenberg and you're going for a world title, I can stand for it then. But if you're like, you know, even coming into national at the weekend and, you know, you're not the one that's going for a podium. You're maybe looking to increase one or two of your rankings. Is it really worth it? And um, so I would be quite strict with lifters um, about that 5% mark. I have gone a little bit higher just for one girl because she um, she's a lifter in our gym. She only started about six months ago and she's extremely competitive straight off the bat and she competes in the 84 category so really her next option is 84 plus which you know it's not the best option in terms of a weight class because she would have to weigh significantly more to be competitive in it um and she also won national champion so it was it was worth it for her to have to to cut a little bit more but as I said, I'm usually quite strict about the 5%, but again, I will always take into account what, why are we cutting? What are the pros? What are the cons? Are you going to improve your placing? Or are you going to place the exact same if you were to up away category and actually enjoy your, your peak and your prep? Mm. Yeah, I, I like that um, both yourself and Kudrick place the, well, I guess like the lowest hanging fruit being uh, gut volume. I think that's always going to be one that's, you know, the easily, the easiest to sort yeah. of like manipulate. Um, I've, I've been personally actually um, just for context. So Auckland Champs is next weekend for us down here in New Zealand. Um, and mm -hmm. I've, uh, I'm coaching, well, I'm managing, self-managing my weight cut, which I don't really need to, but I'm just playing around with it. Um, and a few clients as well. And I, 
And I kind of want to get your thoughts on on this particular sort of like gut manipulation strategy and Kedrick, like do chime in as well. Um, so this is just my, my general understanding of it because I guess the way we see it is like, we don't really want to take them further up the hierarchy if we don't need to, right? Basically, exactly, that's, that's kind yeah. of the, the gist. So what I've been playing with uh, just completely anecdotal there's some evidence to back it up is because during a peak like during a powerlifting peak generally volume isn't a lot unless if you're a little bit dumb like me who goes do like cardio while he's peaking because i'm because you know like i, I was that this conscious decision i made um there isn't i guess necessarily there is some benefit but not significant benefit enough to be like overly uh to, to have a lot of your macros at least con coming from carbohydrates because you know you, you're doing like one rm stuff you know like two rm three rm you're not doing like an eight rm so what mm -hmm. i've had been playing and i think psychologically this actually kind of helps is actually when uh, athletes sort of go into their peak and you kind of like look at their weight and you're like oh we're trending in the right direction but we just want to make the cut a little bit easier so you don't have the stress about it during comp day um actually yeah. kind of shifting to not necessarily like a low carb higher fat diet but just cutting out a little bit more carbon and transferring to fat so just to kind of like gauge the weight as they as they go into a peak because again like as long as we do nutrient timing correctly and all that kind of stuff we'll still be able to train pretty well mm -hmm. because we're not slashing carbs completely, but we're just cutting it out ever so slightly increasing the fat. And psychologically, as the athlete um, starts to see the weight drop, because, you know, it's not necessarily a fat drop. It's literally just gut volume from the get-go at the start. Mm -hmm. um, I, I personally found that it, it helps a lot with their mental because they, they, they do their own research and they're like, oh, I need to be this weight to make the weight class. And then they start to freak out like a month before, like, oh my God, like, I'm not there. And then all of a sudden I'm like, cool, like, let's just try this approach. It's probably not going to affect your training because, well, you're not doing anything more than six. Let's be honest in a peak, maybe, maybe not, hopefully not. <laughs> um, and then yeah. as they get to kind of like the second last week or even the last week of peak, they're pretty much at a really good comfortable spot. And I'm like, well, honestly, you're probably just like a kilo away um, that, that, you know, we can just literally just pivot more into the gut and don't even worry about water. And I just want to kind of get your thoughts on that approach, uh, Jane and Kedrick, because that's something I've been, that's an idea I've been toying around with in the last couple of months. And it seems to work psychologically more for the athlete because they, they see the weight drop, but they don't actually see the, the performance dip in, in that, in that sense. What do you think? Hmm. I think from the point of view of even them. Um satiety in um, a cut having the slightly higher fat with the the lower carbohydrate um, can play out a little bit better just because satiety is something that we want to look at in the diet and um, I personally for myself that's something that I would do because I again I just find that I'm more satiated and I have more fat but again I think that really depends person to person so like if someone does feel better with the higher fat that's something that we look at but if there's someone that that's not really for them they don't really like that we'll look at the the, the other way um but yeah I definitely agree with what you're saying the point that you made about the less stress on you know comp day I, I'm very much so a fan of having someone at the weight that they're going to just do their manipulation from from kind of like if someone's doing a four week peak I would kind of like to have them near that weight because then they have so then you're just manipulating them from that weight for comp so then hopefully after they've rehydrated properly and they've got their food back in they're back nearer that weight and that's the weight that they've done their heavy lifts at that's the weight that they're used to performing at and I think that can psychologically help them as well it's like well I did all my heavy singles you know from around this you know pre-manipulation weight Mm. what Kedrick I think That's... you've muted yourself oh there we go yeah I'm, I'm quite <laughs> I'm quite quite long-winded so bear with me I think that the the most important thing is first up uh, I'm going to put it out there I think that power lifters overestimate how much carbohydrates they need let's just I'm I, yeah. I don't know if yeah you definitely yeah yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah I, I from a purely uh 
physiological perspective, they definitely overestimate the amount of carbohydrates they need for their training. Uh, research has shown uh, even you need a lot of volume, like multiple sets of like sixes and through different exercises, right? Uh, I think the like the landmark paper was done by like uh, Coil, uh, in, like back in the 90s or, or something like that, where they did like multiple sets of sixes and they only depleted like 35% of their muscle glycogen. Uh, mm. And I mean, recently there was paper that showed like, yeah, cool uh, muscle glycogen in different uh, compartments yeah. of the muscle, right? Mm. But the fact of the matter is that we also know that if you're eating carbohydrates, most likely your glycogen stores would be replenished within 24 hours, you know? And mm -hmm. let's face it, most powerlifters, they don't train twice a day, you know? So uh, I would say that a glycogen depleted powerlifter, if they're eating normally, it's quite hard to come by. Uh, and glycogen, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. glycogen depletion is really, I, I was speaking to people and they say, oh, like, I deplete glycogen. And I think you need to know that when you deplete, like muscle glycogen happens when you contract the muscle, meaning if you're not contracting yeah. the muscle and you're just chilling or you're fasted, uh, the glycogen you're, you're getting, uh, for those listeners that don't know, glycogen is basically stored carbohydrates. Uh, you, it's in your liver, right? So you're not actually depleting muscle glycogen. And to deplete 50% of muscle glycogen, you need to be cycling, uh, for 90 minutes at 70% VO2 max and 70% VO2 max roughly correlates to 85% of max heart rate. And a powerlifter would not be able to cycle more than five minutes at 85% <laughs> max heart rate. So you're not going to deplete your glycogen. Uh, let's face it, right? I'm going to no. put this uh, like out there. Yeah. Okay, so let's like get the, the carbohydrate uh, thing uh, out of the way. My next question, the next way I, I kind of frame this is what was, what was their prior intake, right? Because I always look at nutrition as mm. Uh, by what I'm going to implement is going to be is I think about it is how con contrasting it is from the, what they are doing prior yeah. because the more different it is the harder it would be uh, so yeah. if I yeah. would need if I would I'm going to reduce their carbohydrates uh, during a certain time right if they have a huge carbohydrate intake prior and I'm going to cut it down right not to mention you add the stress of peaking as well that could be really dif uh, difficult for them I think that like, uh, mm -hmm. carbohydrates is uh, people overestimate how much carbohydrates they need physiologically, but I do think that carbohydrates, uh, they can play a role uh, psychologically, right? So yeah. we know that there's like studies out there in like carbohydrate mouth rinsing where they just basically yeah. take a sports yeah. drink, they, they rinse their mouth, they don't actually consume the carbohydrate and it upregulates certain uh, uh, like certain parts of the brain. So it helps people feel better in general, like carbohydrate might provide a better sense of well-being. Uh, whether it's uh, the impact on resistance training, I would say it's unclear because there really isn't much studies at resistance training for powerlifting. There isn't much studies that they do where the person's also have been dieting in the past. And then now mm -hmm. you're also uh, trying to do, have benefit from the psychological impact. Most of the studies usually happen acutely, meaning that they get this person rinse their mouth, do ex exercise, right? Yeah. And then maybe they either do a crossover or, or they have a parallel group design. So they have a control where they don't, they just use like a placebo, uh, maybe, maybe like sweetener uh, uh, that there's, there's no carbohydrates. So they, they, it's not really evaluated into uh, in the context of like a chronic diet. So I would say that psychologically, carbohydrates do benefit, which is why personally, what I like to do is I like to get people uh, if I can, right? Because like I said, we play second fiddle to their training performance. I like to get people slightly lower than what they would need to be before they start their cut. Mm -hmm. And then during the peak, I would increase their carbohydrates slightly when, and it gives you more, more opportunity to play with. Obviously, this is very important to plan uh, ahead because I want to make sure that throughout the block, they have minimal uh, impact on performance. So uh, yeah. in general, like that, that, that is how I do things. I, uh, then when the, the fact of the matter is that when it comes to a low gut volume manipulation. Uh, the studies out there is actually not actually clear how much one one can lose, right? Because if we look at the combat sports literature, it's probably the the worst to to say how much you can lose because they say okay, self select lose six percent, you know, lose seven percent. You can use whatever method you want, and then usually the studies just report a combination of like five different methods, and you don't really know which is what. So mm. there, there, there isn't really a normative range, which is why currently I'm in, in my PhD, I'm working on trying to find a normative range for low gut volume. Uh, we, I've not completed the study. Right? It's still in the works. But what I usually do is I reduce the person's uh, carbohydrate 
by 60%, right? So they consume 40% of what they usually consume, but the total amount of calories, I would, uh, I transfer them to fat. So the, the amount of calories they're eating is still the same, right? From an mm-hmm. energy balance perspective. Uh, but obviously the, the, the food weight is less because fat has higher uh, calories yeah. Per, yeah. per gram. So that's essentially what I do. Uh, I usually do that for three days. Uh, and then uh, obviously with reduction of fiber as well. So in general, that's yeah. how I do. I think something I would like to kind of like ask, uh, I mean, it's tangentially related to what you mentioned just now, Jane, was that you reduce like salt intake the last two days. That's what I do as well. My question mm-hmm. to you is, and I don't know the answer, uh, is that what do you think about salt loading, right? So I would share my thoughts first. So like, and then you can just, uh, I mean, if I'm wrong, you don't have to be afraid. You can just say, I think you're wrong. Okay? Like, Cause like I say, I don't know the answer and I don't, based on my knowledge, there's no information in the literature. So personally, uh, I think that many, uh, like manip- manipulating sodium intake uh, by salt loading, it's a, like, it's a huge stretch because I feel like sodium and basically sodium, your sodium balance is like highly regulated by your body. You know, like people who have high sodium intake, Mm -hmm. usually they they say those are the people that suffer from like high blood pressure, right? You eat too much sodium, not enough potassium. You don't have that balance. You have high blood pressure and then, you know, you faint somewhere in the middle of the road or something like that. So I don't think there's any uh, good science backing up sodium uh, manipulation because uh, of how tightly regulated uh, that person, uh, sorry, how tightly regulated the body is, not to mention most people don't really have a clue of how much sodium they eat, you know, and yeah. some people don't and even- and that's a huge part of it, isn't it? Getting them to actually, if you're going to do sodium, you have to get them to be tracking their intake for about like two weeks beforehand and even teaching someone how to track their salt intake like actually looking up salt in my fitness pal and measuring it is, you know, it's that's a challenge in and of itself. Not, not to mention salt doesn't equal sodium, right? So because salt also exactly. is t- yeah. table salt, yeah. Yeah. So exactly. what, what, yeah, what, yeah. What, what exactly are you measuring? I don't know. So usually when people tell me, uh, what I've observed is that, like I said, I like to do it uh, as close to what they're doing prior. So I have people that, mm-hmm. that started working with me and they have cut weight before in the past and they say, oh, I usually like increase my, my salt intake this like, uh, like five days out. As long as it's within range, I usually say, yeah, go ahead. You know, uh, I don't think it will affect things, but if it makes you comfortable, go ahead. I, uh, so, but in general, I think that it doesn't really uh, add a physiological benefit. Uh, but yeah, I'm curious to hear what you think. So I would usually only manipulate salt if someone is doing a 24-hour weigh-in. And again, that's someone that I have that's cutting you like a little bit more weight than they would be for a two-hour weigh-in. And I suppose my caveat with that is that it's probably a bit more of an aggressive cut. And I will usually load salt if someone is on a considerably high amount of water. Um, just because I suppose I don't really want anybody getting hyponatremia um, if they um, because I mean I've seen people that have had to drink like a lot of my a large amount of water to have the effects from loading water um, because I've done you know trials of water cuts with, with people and even personally myself like I have to drink like a very very large amount of water for it to have an effect on me so I would usually a kind of aim for some salt loading with those people just because they are having such a large volume of water they're probably going to feel a bit loopy if they don't increase their salt Mm. um a little bit I don't know if you've ever experienced that feeling of when you drink a load of water and you just feel like totally off Uh, um so yeah I would agree with you I don't really do it on the standard base this it's kind of more so for the those 24 hour weigh-ins and also if i just have someone who's really drinking a large amount of water mm, yeah i think i think that that definitely makes sense on what you said there jane um 
uh like over the last few years like it, it has been such a big thing like oh if you water load and then uh you do you need to do like a like a sodium load particularly sodium not just salt but like actual sodium load yeah. so actually like the na plus not nacl so yeah, just yeah. to just to put it out there for everyone and w- would it just going off what you said and just kind of like tying just tying what you said uh in my head i'm just kind of rambling at this point but would you say that for lighter people who are going to go through a water load, um, you, they don't necessarily need to have too much salt just because the, the consumption of water is obviously not going to be as high as someone who's, let's say, uh, me, who's like a 66 kilo lifter compared to someone who's like a, you know, like a 105 lifter. You know, the, obviously, the amount mm-hmm. of water we consume is going to be significantly different from a water load mm-hmm. perspective. Um, would you then say that for someone who's lighter, trying to water cut or cut down to a weight class potentially not needing to actually salt load but just taking out salt at the end or um yeah yeah. i think i also apart from body weight i also look at someone's habitual water intake um because like if someone if your body weight calculation is giving that they need to drink four liters but they're already drinking three liters of water day like there's someone who just drinks a lot of water it's probably not going to have as much of an effect so I do take someone's habitual water intake into that but yeah I, I would agree on some level what you're saying I suppose I think the main important thing with sodium is I do get everybody to track it because we are going to want them to avoid those that higher sodium intake um at the end of the week so I do make everyone aware I suppose that sodium does affect your weight and that it's something that we need to consider um coming into competition week and I think it for them like looking at that as a variable can teach them about what some of the high salt foods are and what are some of the the low salt foods and that just kind of makes it a bit easier to reduce it when they have to Mm. yeah I think it's also important to kind of like like you integrate that within your nutrition coaching you'll be like yeah you know if you go out and eat uh most likely yeah. you know, there'll be a lot of sodium. That's yeah. why your weight is high next day. So you draw that, yeah. uh, you you create that awareness, right? Because at the end of the day, I think if you just chuck somebody into the deep end and say, oh, don't consume sodium because your weight will go up. They'll be like, what? <laughs> really? You know, since when was that a thing? Yeah. You know, but if you like prior, you say like, okay, cool. You know, let me know when you eat out because when you eat out, I don't expect you to track. Let's just say if you're doing some form of tracking, I don't expect you to track. Exactly, to, yeah. To the tea. Most likely your weight is going to be high the next day. Uh, and then you tell them why. Oh, it's because first of all, you know, the food you might not be used to the, the food. Uh, one, I mean, there's a possibility where some people have just really like sensitive stomach where they eat food and then uh, their stomach like you know it just like feel bloated, right? Not just sodium, yeah. but they just feel like, uh, for lack of a better term, people say oh, I feel really inflamed, right? Because yeah, you know, uh, you you're not used to the food or something, and your stomach might be upset. That that could be one 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 reason. Second, that yeah, you probably have a lot of sodium, you know, and your, your body's holding on to a lot of water. So you draw attention to that. So I think that that's yeah really important. And I mean, at the end of the day, I feel that uh, like, like you mentioned, like it's actually like really difficult to manipulate. But I uh, the good point that you, you brought up was like some people, if you have, cons- you consume high amounts of water, you know, you might have to increase sodium intake. Because like you said, like, uh, like it's a balance, right? Like, like mm-hmm. sodium, potassium, water intake is like this tightly regulated process, not for, not men like for powerlifting or any weight cutting sport. Yeah. It's just so we are trying to manipulate it the best we can. So I think this gives us a really good segue to the next uh, conversation in the, on the next like method in the hierarchy, which is uh, water loading and water cutting. Uh, based on current research, uh, and this is a question that I would like to ask you as well. I don't know the answer once again. Uh, so like I said, He's Don't basically need. just using this as an excuse to like get more answers for his. PhD. Yeah, basically. <laughs> At this uh, point, <laughs> we because you, you brought up a really good point that you said you need you need more uh water right to. Yeah, you need more water to actually feel the effect, and uh, there I know there are different methods where people use to water load, uh, and water cut, and I don't know which is the best way to do it because. Uh, there's nothing out there in the literature. The only paper so far that actually quantified the method of water loading is by real uh, and colleagues, right? Mm-hmm. So in that one, that method they use, uh, 
one liter per every 10 kilo of body weight, right? That's the for three days. And then they uh, cut it to 0.15 on the last day. Uh, so mm-hmm. that is the the classic, uh, I mean, it's, yeah, the paper that quantified the methods. But you mentioned that ha- habitually, if you consume a lot of water, for example, let's just say uh, you are, we combine the 63 kilo class, but let's just say habitually, you consume four liters of water a day, right? And mm-hmm. 10 times body weight for you, uh, sorry, 10 times, 10, one liter per 10 kilo body weight, if you follow the guidelines, would just be six, 6.3 liters, right? Which is not really mm-hmm. a big uh, increase, you know? Uh, yeah. So, but where some people, for example, like I'm not even kidding, where I know somebody that only drink like 500 mils of water a day. Yeah, I had right. a, that girl I was talking about that cut to, to 84. Her water load was like three and a half liters. And she was like, this is so much water because yeah. she literally doesn't drink water like yeah. at all. <laughs> yeah. So, my, my, so dehydrated. My <laughs> question to you is how would you usually prescribe your water load? Do you use, uh, like, do you multiply their, their current intake by X amount? If so, what is that amount? Or do you follow the the formula by real, which use a multiplier of their body weight? Because like you said, if that li- that that female lifter who is the 84 kilos say that three and a half liters of water is a lot, can you imagine her drinking the recommendation by real? She would probably be drinking 8.5 liters, which is five liters more than what you're already giving her. So that is yeah. like, my question to you, uh, how do you usually recommend your, your water loading? I do multipliers based off habitual intake. Um, just because I do find that the body weight, just it just doesn't work for everyone in the context that you put there. That like, I my personal experience is that I would drink like at least three liters of water on an average day. So when I water load, as you said, that's 6.3 liters, it's not actually enough to have an effect uh, versus my other lady who 3.5 liters was a huge amount of water for her and um, I actually use um, a calculator uh, which the strength athletes uh, brought out um, for their their water load um, and it it depends on the person so I'll do out their calculation um, and it's used off their habitual intake but I I when I have someone comp week obviously I mean you're probably the same I get them to contact me with their weight every single morning and we adjust the plan based on what's what's necessary so I might increase their water more than what the plan says based as the week goes along depending on what their weight is doing or how it's reacting so I suppose I do use a multiplier based off habitual intake but I would be flexible with in that and I think that's kind of uh, the more weight cuts I've done the more knowledge I've gained on being able to like knowing how to adjust someone's water intake but yeah I do think using multiplier of intake is better than multiplier of body weight yeah I think that 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 is true as well you know I feel at the end of the day uh like I said I don't know the which which is actually better and I think what uh in my my uh PhD right that's what mm. i'm gonna like find out i'm just gonna use uh, oh great <laughs> yeah we, i mean this are all answers K- kedrick, kedrick will have to come up with uh with a calculator performance performance water loading calculator and like pattern yeah. it like, like actually pattern it you know especially after you've done all your research when you've got the phd you know you should pattern yeah. that idea and be like yeah. this is the gold standard <laughs> I, for water loading I, and water cutting like like to be honest i i honestly don't think that uh, I can confidently say that this will work 100% of the time because so far in my career, I've uh, had three lifters that doesn't respond to water loading or water cutting at all, right? So I, yeah. I like I said, I, I don't know why, uh, even in papers, like read the paper by real, they, they can't really tease out like the me- mechanisms on why like, the water loading work because they said whatever they believe the hypothesis, it like it didn't, it wasn't really like, the, me- the mechanisms were, were not confirmed, you know, so I, I can't really mm-hmm. s- say that, okay, X method works, X, X method doesn't. What I'm trying to find out is that, you know, cool, my, my role is quite simple. Is I want to make this as easy as possible for the lifter, right? Exactly, yeah. So if I go with multiplier over habitual intake and that works, and if that is a lower amount, we'll use that, you know, if I basically, yeah. what I want to do is I want to go with the lowest amount 
the lowest increase for that person, so it's not difficult. Uh, yeah. And still have that effect. So that's what I'm trying to find out. So I'm just gonna basically have the same person come in do the uh, water load X way, right? Then after a wash over uh, wash up period, repeat the water load in a different way, and then we just quantify the different amounts of weight loss across. And obviously, with like hopefully with like thirteen or fifteen participants, I'm able to actually find out uh, what what actually uh, happened. Uh, so to kind of tease out what's the best way to do things. Like I said, my my role is not to like, oh yeah, I'm gonna sell you this this method. I'm just like cool. I think this is the easiest way, which is why I said that if you yeah. if you do this way and it works for you in the past, I'm not gonna change it. I'm not gonna like suddenly overhaul something, right? Because yeah, not to mention if you change something, the person will be like, oh, I'm not really like there. There's uncertainty, and uncertainty would 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 add a fear as well. Because when someone's exactly, drinking a lot of yeah. water, their weight on the scale will go up, right? Naturally. They should go up by a bit and be like, oh my gosh, I'm gaining weight, you know? Uh, and if this, then they'd be like, oh no, what if this doesn't work? What if I hold on to all the water? So your role as a coach is like, yeah, you know, you know, things will be okay. Uh, you know, trust the process, you know, the, those, those cliches you throw out. But if something has already been yeah. working, why are you going to go and throw the uncertainty in like a couple of days before competition? So no, I actually yeah. wanted to kind of add something in on water cutting is that, uh, or sorry, water loading and water cutting because it can be one or both. Um, is something I found from anecdotal experience is really explaining to lifters that they need to spread the water intake out throughout the entire day for it to have a proper effect yep. um because I've had people who've done it before and they're like oh it didn't really work on me but they literally left like four liters till like seven o'clock in the evening um because they're not used to drinking that amount of water and they weren't really like on drinking their water intake um I usually get people to like get like a small bottle and be like how many of those do you have to have and then set a time throughout the day um that's something that I mean again I don't know the the mechanistics of it I suppose it's probably because you're you're actually just going to the bathroom more frequently throughout the day if you're spreading it out better um that's something that I've noticed that has helped made a difference in people's water load is spreading out the water intake throughout the entire day um and then for some people as well I would say try to have like 80 percent of it before 6 p.m so that you're not getting up all night to go to the bathroom and then getting poor sleep the week of competition as well yeah I I was actually in my head when you said spreading out the water I I before you you mentioned 80 percent before 6 p.m in my head i was like yeah i'm gonna tell her that i use 80 percent before 6 p.m but you already said it so uh i, I guess you kind of like but that, rep, but, that rep, but that's also mind. but that's also like the, the the whole like oh we generally recommend people do this but a lot of the time like especially in like the first two days i think of like an actual war in the first two days people is like that's especially like when they're when they're going from like let's say three liters to like six liters like double up that first two days just sucks. You're like, oh, I'm just gonna, li- I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm just gonna wait until like I can get two liters before bed. I'm just gonna like, try to down it, and then they sit in bed and like, why am I doing this again? <laughs> just yeah. So I think, Je- yeah, oh. go ahead. And I, and I think one one of the things that Kedrick you mentioned, I think was quite interesting as well as I guess being part of like a nutrition coach in general, particularly in this whole very very specific niche context of rapid weight loss. I think it's also uh, getting your athlete to realize that um, there's obviously numbers and, and papers and science out there, but if we can treat each cut, each rapid cut as an experiment and just kind of see like which one works best, I think it, it yeah. also gain, gives them confidence, right? As, as per, I, I'm sure all three of us here would agree on the call. Like um, if someone is going to do a water load or a water cut, just get the first one in get that experience in and then as you do more of it you start to figure out oh you know like i actually prefer that one better because i felt better uh my deload was a lot better as well you know um barring all the other factors etc etc i think if as, as an athlete if you can you know obviously talk to your coach but treat each water load as an experiment as well and then if you are uh, able to I guess represent your country to go to worlds and stuff like that then it's kind of just like looking at what you've done in the past and it's like oh this one worked best this approach worked exactly, best yeah. we're gonna do that and I think if uh, for both coach and athlete I guess it's just making sure like 
it's not always a fail. Like Kedrick said, he hit three people who didn't respond well to a water load and a water cut. But it's also a case of like, for those three people, I would probably say, hey, maybe that didn't work. Like try just talk to Kedrick again, I guess, and try to try out another strategy because, hey, he's the one doing a PhD. I'm sure he probably has most of the answers. Um, like just, just give it another crack, try another method, you know, yeah. see, what works, see what works best. Because I swear to God, like some people just like to what like will love to water load and not do gut manipulation as like the first uh you know like low hanging fruit because they'd be like oh mm. drinking water is easy for me whereas some people it's like 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 your client uh 500 mils to you know three 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 and a half liters is a big ask <laughs> yeah yeah i think uh based on your question uh, i i definitely agree with that as well in terms of like spreading out your water my my hypothesis, obviously, this is just what I think based on understanding how the human uh, physiology functions is that I think uh, our body, like I said, is really like tightly regulated, right? Like uh, yeah. our, our brain con- um, and our hormones, uh, the feedback loops are really tightly regulated for a certain reason. And what uh, I think is that the hormones involve uh, mainly uh, ADH, right? Antidiuretic hormone yeah. uh, is basically stimulated by uh, the pituitary lobe, like one of the parts of the brain. And if we think about, like I think of this mechanistically from like thresholds, right? So our body has like certain adaptation thresholds. Uh, for example, uh, muscle protein synthesis, we use this very, I, I use this in, I use this example because I think it's more uh, relatable. It's just, let's just say if you eat 100 grams of protein versus like mm. 30 grams of protein and if, uh, you you meet that lu- that leucine threshold around the two point five grams of leucine. Your muscle protein synthesis is going to be maximum, right? Whether it's hundred grams or whether it's thirty grams, right? I'm not saying that hundred grams is uh not as uh you don't. I'm not saying you only need thirty grams, but I'm saying that that threshold of mm. uh, muscle protein synthesis has been met by the maximum amount. So perhaps uh the the ADH right functions in a similar manner where uh you actually uh the maximum threshold, or let's just say if you consume X amount of water in X amount of time, you maximize that, that yeah. threshold. And then uh, what happens is that if the more you can kind of like maximize that threshold, which means that you need some like, maybe it's like certain like down regulation and then you up regulate it again, your body gets used to that rather than, right, I'm just going to consume four liters and you still get that similar spike of uh, whatever hormone or yeah. Uh, which is the maximum. So I think that the body is really tightly regulated in that manner and you need to consist, like, consistently expose uh, someone to that. I think that that might actually be something that uh, uh, that might be a potential mechanism uh, out there, but I can't, I can't say for sure. You know, I, I would love to do all the studies. Unfortunately, uh, exercise science is not uh, heavily funded. So whoever that's <laughs> listening out there that has all the money and if you want to fund some studies, let me know. Or if you want to do the studies by yourself and want to talk to me about study design let me know as well but yeah i think that's uh uh really like we we covered a lot a lot of uh a lot today and i think the big part for you uh is the, like a question i like to ask you is when it comes to making uh like calling like an audible like when you look at an athlete and be like okay cool whatever i've been doing right uh uh, like things are not working. Like you mentioned just now, you had experience uh, on when to adjust water intake, right? And if you read the scientific paper, they don't do that because obviously there has to be a control experiment. So how, in, in, in your experience, how often do you have to adjust things on the fly? or mm. And when do you find that to be necessary? Or do you just say, tell the athlete, okay, cool. Uh, I'm not gonna like in, in your head. I'm not gonna adjust everything, but I'm gonna just tell the athlete to stick to it. So my question is, when do you adjust it for the athlete, or when do you tell the athlete to just stick to it? Uh, yeah, I think that, that yeah. So it's more like a practice question. Yeah, I suppose as I said, when I have someone on comp week, I will get them to text me their weight every morning, but I'll also get them to text me their weight before they went to bed the night before. So I guess that you know some people call it the float weight. So like the, how much waste that you're you're losing overnight and I suppose the main thing I would actually usually adjust is to maybe down regulate the plan to do less 
um, because what I will usually do is I will make out their plan for like their seven days based on what they're weighing on their first day um, to, for them to make weight on comp day. But as time goes on and if their weight is dropping, we don't necessarily need to do like, maybe we don't need to cut carbs as hard. Maybe we don't need to, you know, do as low volume, like as in like drinking liquids. Maybe you can still, you know, eat your, some of your carbs and, and things like that. So I suppose the main thing I would usually do when I'm adjusting things is probably maybe take away some aspects of the plan because I, again this goes back to the point that we all made is that we just want to make it as easy as possible um for the person um and if we don't have to do certain methods there's absolutely zero reason for us to be to be doing them um so yeah i think if per someone's weight is trending in the right direction um i'd probably have a discussion about you know, maybe keeping carbs like a little bit higher, um, even from for that psychological aspect that we talked about. I mean, I think the main thing people fear when they're cutting carbs going into a comp is that like, well, I always eat high carbs and carbs are good for powerlifting performance. So I'm not going to perform well because I'm, I'm cutting carbs. So if I'm able to tell them, well, actually, we can have like 30 or 40 grams more than we planned today, that can even have like a psychological benefit for them. So yeah, I'd say more often than not, I'm telling people just to really kind of strip it back to the minimum of what we absolutely have to do as the week goes on, because someone's weight at the start of a weight cut can be very different to how it is four days in and how it is right the day before. And that's why I think that I do like to have that daily contact with, with people. Mm. Yeah, I think definitely adjusting on the fly is is very important um because it like everyone probably knows this but everyone's built different as Kedrick used yeah. that phrase um and i think it's it's also a thing like especially people get into the, the middle of the the water load you know especially if you're water loading you see a weight basically being the highest it's probably ever been in your in, in like the peaking month and you're like starting to freak out I think it's just those small adjustments and like both yourself and Kedrick mentioned, just those small reassurances like, hey, either stick or change, I think can be very beneficial um, because at the end of the day, like we want the athlete to not just make weight, obviously, which is one of the goals, but it's also to make sure we get there um, easily and also yeah. enjoy, um, you know, the actual game day itself and you know, hopefully go nine for nine, right? Yeah, definitely. So, um awesome well the episode has been really great and we generally always ask our guests this question uh jane so taking it back to square one what would be your advice for someone who is wanting to do their first ever water cut taking it back to square one is why do you want to do the water cut. Mm -hmm. I want to know why do you, why do you want to do it? Mm -hmm. Honestly, um, and that's what when anyone comes to me saying that they cut weight, that's where I'll go to first before I say let's let's do it. Um, it's what I talk about these pros and cons of weight cutting. Often the cons can be a lot higher than people realize, especially for new people. You know, you were talking earlier, Kedrick, about how the new people don't really maybe have the skill for weight cutting, but a lot of them don't have the muscle mass to be, you know, cutting weight. I mean, you see these elite people in the IPF that cut weight and still win champ world championships, but they have very high levels of muscle mass and they're still able to win with a total that is less than maybe what they're able to perform at in training. So, yeah, taking it back to square one is wh why do you want a water cut and really looking at the reasoning behind it and whether it's a feasible or a smart option for you. Awesome. All right. So yeah, thank you for your time, Jane. This uh, episode has been fantastic. I think it's nice for once, like I said, myself, not being the one answering the questions. Uh, <laughs> you know, after a while, when you do a lot of uh, this kind of stuff, people just say, oh, cool. You know, can you come on my podcast and talk about this? I'm like, yeah, you know, like, because as a person, that's the, literally the only thing I can talk about ever, right? I, like, I cannot talk about anything else, but I only can talk about rapid weight, weight cutting. So it's nice for once to be on, on the listening end, if, even though I think I uh, did a fair bit of talking because I just like to do, uh, be long-winded. <laughs> but thank you so much for your time. I think that this episode has been really uh, insightful and let uh, 
let our listeners know uh, where where they can find you and reach out if they they want to yeah they want to help or they want uh, to, to to ask any questions. Yeah, um, so the best place to get me is probably my Instagram. Um, I'm at Jane, uh, Jane with a Y, J A Y N E, uh, Kate underscore. Um, and you can also follow at Abs Powerlifting. Um, is the club that I do nutrition coaching under as well. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much for the time. So uh, thank you for all the listeners that have been listening and supporting us. And if you think that this episode has been useful for you or maybe your friends or anyone you know who actually is contemplating on cutting weight, especially, uh, yes, there's a competition coming up in uh, New Zealand. And we're trying, to get, more... we're trying to get this before, that, before, before Sunday. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ma- ma- many more competitions coming up. You know, uh, I think this topic of weight cutting would always be... Uh, be brought up uh, as long as people cut weight so yeah please share them with all with your with your friends and fellow athletes and thank you all for listening don't forget to like uh subscribe you know on you if you watch this on youtube which you are one of like the five five people that watch this on youtube besides my uh besides three of my family members uh click the bell you know and yeah and till next time Later.